We are just studying God's Word verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and uh, Jeremiah is where we are. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your Word, and uh, Lord, as we come into this time of study, we really do more than just open our mind. Lord, we want to understand so much more than just the facts of what happened. Lord, we want to be changed because we have learned about who you are. And we've entered into a relationship with you because we've opened our heart and we poured out our soul. Lord, tonight we want to be transformed in our soul because you are moving by your Holy Spirit upon us. We pray that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Jeremiah is in Jerusalem, and uh, he's a, a prophet, very young man when he begins his ministry. In fact, it's one of the things he said about that to the Lord. I'm young. And God said, don't say that I'm young, because uh, I will be with you, and you will speak the words that I put in your mouth to speak. And uh, do not be concerned or afraid of them, the establishment, the prophets that were not speaking the words of God, because I will protect you and I'll be with you. So there's the promise of God over Jeremiah. Uh, the king beginning at Jeremiah's ministry was Josiah. Josiah is the last of the good kings. Why was he a good king? Because he honored the Lord as his father David had done, loved God with his heart, and remember this part of the story, because it really is key, um, the, the ones that had come before him, the kings that had come before him, uh, just brought the nation into downfall. The, the nations were just in, in, the kings were just brought it into a terrible place uh, spiritually. They had gone after every god you can imagine around them. And remember now, these, quote, gods around them were, uh, um, hmm, how do you say it? No gods at all, of course, but um, gods of worldliness, gods of every imaginable debauchery and sinful mess you can possibly imagine. So you might say, well, why, why were they going after gods like that? For the very reason I just described, because they were every worldly, disgusting, sexual, perversion thing that you can possibly think of. There was a God about it. And so that was the problem. They were leading the nation just down into despair, and all the results of it were a mess. You know, the way of a sinner is hard. Well, it's true for a nation, too. It's not just a person, a nation. And their nation was just going terribly down in the mud and all of the disaster that followed with it. Here comes Josiah. He was eight years old when he became king. And one day, they were rummaging through the temple and they happened upon a copy of the law. Now, what is interesting is that this was an amazing discovery. Apparently, there were no working copies of the law anywhere. And so this was an amazing thing. Oh, you're not going to believe what we found in the archives. We found a copy of what was rumored, you know, the, the, the law of God. We actually have a copy of it. And so someone read the entire thing to Josiah. He sat there and listened to the entire thing. And when he finished listening to it, he began to just cry and weep. He, tore, he took hold of his robe and he just ripped it, which was a sign of, of just a broken heart. And he just tore his robe and he said, now I understand why God has been so angry with our nation and why this nation has been in such trouble. And then he then said, we are going to have revival. And so he said, clean out every despicable thing, get those gods out of here, burn the high places, we're going to have revival, we're going to cleanse the whole place. And that's what he did. Some things that had not been done or purged in all of the kings since Solomon. And even in the temple, it's like, can you believe this? They even had some of these, quote, altars to these foreign gods set up in the temple of the living God. There were even 
altars in the temple of homosexuality in the temple of the living God. Can you imagine the offense? And uh, Josiah said, get all of it out. Well, what's interesting is that the revival that followed, which is really uh, Israel's last revival, was a revival of outer form, but not inward reality. The king said he wants revival. We better have revival, because he's got soldiers behind him. And so, you know, they did what the king said, but they didn't mean it. And see, this is important for us. God doesn't want us just to fake it. God doesn't want us just to do outward, okay, I'll put on the form of the thing. But the inward reality is far, far different. Let me ask you a question. Uh, Do we have, quote, gods or altars to these other gods today? Well, not in the formal sense, but in the informal sense, absolutely. Because people put these things on the altar of their heart. They go after these things that that the world finds very desirable and very cool and very hip and very in. And man, you are just living the right life if you've got this, you know, metrosexual approach to your life. God says the things that the world finds desirable, God finds detestable. And the problem is when people then try to have the outer form, oh yeah, well, we do want to kind of honor God a little, you know, with with our lives. And so they have the outer form of the thing. But inward reality is that they still have this going on. And so this is where God says, now, wait a minute. I want genuine revival. I want authentic heart. And so the book of Jeremiah is a call to revival. It's a call to come back. It's a call to the heart. And that's what we see over and over and over again. Now, here's something else we're going to see as we go through this book. God is not afraid to call it out straight. Now, I love that about God. Don't you think? Aren't there times in your life when you don't want, uh, you know, to be pandered to, when you just want it straight up? You know what I'm saying? Don't you think that sometimes it's great just to have a little cold water right in the face? (laughs) I'm thinking we need it. And so here's what we see in Jeremiah, beginning in chapter 2, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, and he said this, Go, I want you to go. Proclaim it in the ears of Jerusalem. Shout it out. I want you to say this. You say, Thus says the Lord, I remember. I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothals, your following after me in the wilderness through a land not sown. So he brings up marriage. And he says, oh, don't you remember the love that you had at first? And he's kind of giving that picture of a young couple that, is, you know, at the first of their relationship, oh, they are in love. Can anybody relate to this? I mean, they are in love. And they are just so into each other. And it is love. I mean, it is true love. It's pure love. It's love. I'm not trying to mock it. I'm trying to honor it. It's on. It's great. It's love. It's real. Amen? Then he says, but then what happened? But then what happened? Oh, I remember. Do you remember? Oh, the love. Oh, we were in love. What happened? And see, this is what he's saying. Oh, I remember your relationship to God. It was like that. When you first came to the Lord, yes, forgave my sin. Oh, if you knew my sin, Pastor, you, you, wouldn't, you, would, be, you would be just like, wow. Because of how much he, he forgave me and he, he invited me into a loving relationship. It's, it's, it blows my mind, Pastor. It's just an amazing thing. He says, oh, I remember the zeal you had at the first. I remember the love you had at the first. What happened? I want it back. Come on. Fall in love with me again. Fall in love with me again. That's what he's saying. That's revival, isn't it? That's a call to revival. What is revival? Revival is not the outer form of the thing. Revival is when there's life again, when there's love again. What is the highest, first, foremost of all the commandments that God has ever given us? Love Love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And then the second commandment is very much like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you accomplish those two things, you would have accomplished the entirety of the Old Testament law. Isn't that an amazing thing? So he says, he's calling them back. Oh, I remember. I remember the love that you had at the first, the devotion, the love of your betrothals, the following after me in the wilderness through a land not sown. Oh, it was an adventure. We walked with God. It was an adventure. Israel was holy to the Lord in those days. The first of his harvest. All who ate of it, in other words, anyone who tried to consume Israel was guilty. Evil came upon them, declares the Lord. So then he said, now hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. And this is even to the northern kingdom. Thus says the Lord, what injustice did your fathers find in me? That they went far from me? and walked after emptiness and became empty? Did they find some fault? Was there something wrong with God that you had to go and pursue all these other things? Was there something wrong with God? Was there something wrong in your relationship to God? Did he disappoint you in some way? Did he let you down? Did he not offer you all of these wondrous promises that you should go after things that are empty? Because if you go after things that are empty, he says right here in verse 5, you're going to become empty. They didn't say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt? They didn't seek God for that. Uh, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and deep darkness, through a land that no one crossed and where no man dwelt. I brought you into a fruitful land. In other words, can we go back and remember all that God has done? Oh, man, has God ever blessed you? He says, let's go back over it, shall we? Let's review it together. Did you find any fault in God? No, look at what he did. He brought you through all the, this, all the dangers. He brought you through all these difficulties. I brought you into, verse 7, a fruitful land to eat of the fruit of it and have blessings and eat of good things. But then you came, and you defiled my land. And my inheritance you made an abomination. See, here's God calling it straight up. The priest didn't say, where's, where's the Lord? And those who handle the law, they don't know me. The rulers, they transgressed against me also. And the prophets, they prophesied by Baal. And they walked after things that didn't profit them one bit. In fact, not only didn't they profit, they hurt. Therefore, he says, verse 9, Therefore, I'm going to contend with you, declares the Lord. And with your sons' sons, I will contend. Now, whenever God says, I'm going to contend with you, that pretty much means you're in big trouble. Because what that means is that he then is going to resist you at every turn. Now, why would God resist you? To prevent you from walking down the path of destruction. You know, it's imagine, okay, imagine that we've got a fellow here, and he's walking across, and he's headed, you know, out that door, and he's going to go right, you know, into a pit, and he's going to just ruin his life. If I love him, I'm going to... I'm going to do something to try to prevent him, right? So I'm going to talk to him. Hey, man, don't do this. What are you doing? And he turns this way. Man, don't do this. And he turns this way. Man, don't do this. Think about what you're doing here because it's about, this is going to be dangerous. And you keep walking with, you keep resisting him at every turn. You're contending with him. You're running crosswise against him because you're trying to help him. This is what God does to us. That's a good thing. When God contends with us, it's a good thing because he's trying to prevent us from blowing up our lives. And so this is what we have to say. I will contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your son's sons I'm going to contend. Verse 10, he says, now look, cross to the coastlands of Katim and see, and uh, send to Kedar and observe there, and see if there's ever been such a thing as this. Has this ever happened? Has a nation changed gods when they weren't even gods at all? 
It doesn't happen. My people changed their glory for that which does not profit. And then he says, be appalled, O heavens. In other words, heaven is my witness. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. Two evils, I'll tell you what they are, he says. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and then they hewed out, they cut out for themselves cisterns that were broken, that could hold no water. And he said, now can you look at this with me and tell me, does this make any sense? Does this make any sense at all? These people, he said, let me tell you what they've done. Two evils. First of all, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Was there something wrong with your relationship to God? Wasn't it glorious? Wasn't there just amazing blessing being poured out of your life? Why would you forsake that, the fountain of living waters? And then hew out for yourselves cisterns. You know what a cistern is? It would be, they would take uh, the rock, the bedrock, and they would chip out this rock until they had a huge pit. And then what they would do is they would run their, their rainwater into it so they would have a source of water. You know, well, that's pretty clever. Until you realize that that water would just sit in there and it would get, I don't know, have you ever seen water that just sat there for a long time really hot? And it starts to kind of smell a little bit, and it starts to take a little film on the top, and things start growing in there, and strange things start swimming in there. And this is the thing that you're supposed to drink. And he said, which would you rather have, fresh water? And you're supposed to think of a, of a bubbling brook, cool, dripping over the rocks. Like, oh, on a hot day, oh, how refreshing is cold water to the soul. And it's living water, which means it's fresh. It's, it's, you know, vibrant, full of life. Would you rather have living water or would you rather have some water out of that stagnant green stuff with things growing in it? And he said, here's the problem. That cistern with all the green stuff growing in it, it also has a hole and it leaks. And it'll do you no good. Why would you, have, why would you want that? Why is that better than living water? He says, it's not. The problem is, people get so distorted in their minds. And what is he trying to do? He's trying to wake them up with a nice glass of fresh water right in their face. I think it's glorious. How about you? But we need it too, right? We need it too. Verse 14, he says, now look, is Israel a slave? Is he a homebound servant? No. Then why did he become a prey? Young lions roared at him. They roared loudly too. And they made his land a waste. His cities have been destroyed without inhabitant. And this was the condition of the time. Northern kingdom was pretty much destroyed. Even in the southern kingdom, many cities were destroyed. Also, the men of Menvis and Toponis, they've shaved the crown of your head. He said, verse 17. Now, would you notice verse 17? I got this underlined in my Bible because it's really key. He said, have you not done this to yourself? Didn't you do this? Wasn't this your own doing? Didn't you make all those really dumb decisions that led you down into the path that pretty much destroyed your life? Wasn't that you that did that? Now, why does God say that? You've got to know his heart. This is important. Is he, you know the phrase, rubbing your nose in it? Is that what he's doing? See, no, that's not what he's doing. He's not, he's not gloating or saying, I, I knew it. I knew you'd mess up. I knew you'd ruin your life. You know what? Now, just take a good stiff whiff of it, because guess what? You made pretty much a stink of the whole thing. No, that's not God's heart. He says, I want you to see something. I want you to open your eyes and see something. You did this. Now, what's going to follow are promises. You did this, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Okay, you messed up, and I'm going to redeem you. You blew it, and I'm going to forgive you. 
see, what is God trying to show them? He's trying to show them the contrast of their nature going after those things and the glory of his heart. So that what? So they could see that heart and fall in love with him again. God, you're amazing. Notice what he says, verse 17. Have you not done this to yourself by your forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? He was leading you. What happened? Now, what now? What are you doing? This is what, verse 18. What are you doing on the road to Egypt to drink the waters of the Nile? Oh, you're going down there. What are you doing on the road to Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? What are you doing? He said, look at verse 19. I've underlined in this one. Listen to this. Your own wickedness will correct you. That's a good word. Your own wickedness will correct you. In other words, some of the things that happen to get our attention are oftentimes the things that we do to ourselves. And he's trying to wake them up. And he says, look, is it not your wickedness that will correct you and your apostasies? They will reprove you. Know therefore and see, know therefore and see that it is evil and bitter to forsake the Lord your God. And the dread of me is not in you, declares the Lord. For long ago I broke your yoke. I tore off your bonds. Remember, we need freedom. But you said, I won't serve the Lord. No, no, that's right, you didn't. Because on every high hill and under every green tree, you laid down like a harlot. Okay, now here's the Lord going to just call it straight up, what they were doing. And remember that he uses spiritual adultery as an image of those whose hearts have gone away you know, to other gods. But here's the thing. Even though it's a spiritual adultery, there were actual real adulteries involved in it because much of these gods of the world had sexual perversion elements to them. And what would happen is they would set up these, quote, groves. Okay, they would plant trees uh, on some hill. And then the whole idea was what happened inside that grove was secret. Inside that grove was some kind of secret altar, and there would be, quote, temple sexual perversion things going on in there. And that's what he's saying. He says, look, have you not laid down under every green tree, laying down like a harlot? Verse 21, look, I planted you like a choice vine. Oh, completely faithful seed. How then have you turned yourself before me into the degenerate roots or shoots of a foreign vine? Although you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your iniquity is before me, declares the Lord. You can imagine a person afterwards feeling the guilt and the remorse. What did I just do? See, can anybody relate to this? You know, doing something really dumb and then later feeling that, that, that weight of, what, did I just do that? And then resolve that you're not going to do that again, but then you do it again, and you, then you feel, oh, so how did I do that? But then you find yourself doing it again, and you feel that remorse. How in the world did I do that? But then you find yourself doing it again. Can anybody relate to this at all? And, he, and he, he's, he's saying, look, I'm going to tell you the answer to this. The answer is much more glorious to the believer in Jesus Christ because he gives the Holy Spirit of the living God. The joy of the Lord is your strength. If we fall in love with the Lord again, we won't be needing those things because the soul won't be empty. See, what's happening is it's the empty soul that's longing for something. What is that? It's longing for intimacy, longing for relationship. Of course, those are all fake, false, lying types of relationships, but nevertheless, that's what the soul is wanting. I want intimacy. I want vulnerability. And so we, we, people go after things which are lies. Oh, I'll give you, as she bats her eyes across the screen, I'll give you vulnerability. You want vulnerability? I'll give you vulnerability. But then the soul is empty. The soul is sick. 
I don't want to do that anymore. Then God says, then don't. I will fill your soul. I'll fill your soul. We need an answer. The answer is this. Let your soul be filled with the presence of the living God. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Fall in love with God again. Stay near to him. Stop wandering in the desert. Stop wandering into the groves and stop doing things in secret when you know that your God loves you and sees everything in secret anyway. Amen? And he's calling us to revival. Come on, he says, come on, let's go for revival. Come on. I love you. Remember the love you had for me? Let's renew that love. Let's renew that love because that's the key. I want you to fall in love with me again. I planted you as a choice vine. But verse 22, although you wash yourself and use much soap, your stain is before me. You can imagine someone coming back, washing, washing with soap. Soap is never going to do it. You know what you need? You need blood. Soap never does it. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. What you need is the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood is the forgiveness that we need. His blood is what washes as white as snow. That's what it says in the book of Isaiah. And there's the promise. I will forgive your sin. I will wash. I will make you clean. You draw near to me. I'll wash and I'll refresh I'll restore your soul, and then you stay right here. You stay near to the living God. Amen? It's a very important thing. But, verse 22, how can you say, I am not defiled, I've not gone away after the Baals? Look at your way. See, here's the problem. Some of them were in straight-up denial. Like, I've not done anything wrong as they wiped their mouth. I haven't done anything wrong. Me? I was nothing wrong with me. I didn't do anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. You can just imagine all this self. There's nothing wrong with that. And so he says, really? You say, how can you say that? I'm not defiled. I haven't gone after the bales. Look, look at your way in the, val- in the valley. Know what you have done. You are like a swift young camel. Okay, he's going to use some pictures here. You are like a swift young camel entangling her ways. You're like a wild donkey accustomed to the wilderness that sniffs the wind in her passion. In the time of her heat, who can turn her away? All who seek her will not be weary. In other words, you can see all the sexual connotations to what he is saying. You're like a wild donkey that sniffs the wind in her passion. The time of her heat. Who can turn her away? All who seek her will not become weary. In her month, they will find her. You know, we live in a society that is saturated with sexuality. Isn't that true? We live in a society that is saturated with sexuality. And we have to decide whether or not we're going to believe that God knows what he's talking about when he tells us that these things are actually very destructive and very damaging to the soul. And they draw us away. He says, how can you have revival when, when, when all of these things are happening? He says, look, and you know how they justify it. Oh, come on, welcome to the whatever we're in. I remember when I was uh, working in the restaurant business, and this was back in the, in the 90s, uh, early 90s, and uh, this other waiter was talking to me and we were in the back room doing something or other and setting up and uh, he's bragging to me about moving in with his girlfriend and uh, so I didn't know, you know, I, I decided to just use some humor and I said, does your mother know about this? And he said, my mother? Of course my mother knows about it. She's all for it. And I go, Really? And he said, hey, wake up. Welcome to the 90s. This was his comment. Welcome to the 90s. <clears throat> My response was, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> when, when God said that these things aren't his heart, he said them a long time ago, but his heart has never changed. 
And then he said, oh, why do you have to make it such a spiritual heavy thing? I said, hey, you brought it up. But isn't that the way we kind of justify it? Hey, we're living in the modern day. We're living in a modern era. And you know, it's the way everybody is nowadays. Nowadays, it's perfectly fine to be sexually, you know, all that. And he says, can, I, can we get this straight? He says, can we talk about this? He says, verse 25, keep your feet from being un, unshod and your throat from, fur, uh, from thirst. But you said, it's helpless. No, for I have loved strangers. And after them, I will walk. I will do it. No one's going to stop me. I'm going to do it. He says, as a thief is shamed when he's discovered, so the house of Israel is shamed. They, their kings, their princes, their priests, their prophets, who say to a tree, you are my father, and say to a stone, you gave me birth. You've turned your back on me and not your face. I see right there is a key, isn't it? You've turned your back to me and not your face. Ah, that's a picture of relationship. You know exactly what I'm saying. Uh, married couples will know this. A married couple that's not doing very well will sleep with their backs turned towards each other. Is this not true? Okay, no one wants to raise their hand. <laughs> we know it's true, but I don't want to raise my hand because I don't want to admit it's true with me. I've been married almost 30 years. I know how it goes. We've had tiffs also. I mean, they're always her fault, but you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm sitting, I'm just kidding. But see, here's, here's my point. If your back is turned, it says, we're not close right now. We're not really being, you know, having relationship. He says, but you turn your face. Is your face to the Lord? Or is your back to the Lord? See, if your face is to the Lord, you see the difference? If your face is to the Lord, it's like, God, here I am. I'm open, I'm honest, I'm vulnerable. Here I am, Lord. See, that's the relationship that he wants. When you turn your back to the Lord, you're pretending that he can't see. You're pretending that, you know, he doesn't, but he says, turn your face. It's a beautiful picture for us to understand. And then he goes on, verse 27. In the time of their trouble, then they'll say, arise and save us. Sure. But where, oh, but where are your gods which you made for yourself? Let them arise if they can save you in the time of trouble. For according to the number of your cities are your gods. That's how many gods you have, Judah. Just count the number of cities and that's how many gods you have. Let them save you. These, quote, gods that you have, where are they in times of trouble? Let them call out to them. Budweiser, help me. Well, they're not going to help you. So he goes on. Why do you contend with me? Verse 29. Why do you contend with me? You're the ones that have transgressed against me, declares the Lord. In vain I have struck your sons. They accept no chastening. In other words, I tried to discipline, I tried to spank them. They wouldn't even take that. Your sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. In other words, whenever God would send a prophet to call them back, they would kill them. Remember what Jesus said? Oh, Jerusalem, those who kill prophets and forsake those sent to her. And so this is the same point. Verse 31, O generation, heed the word of the Lord. Have I not been a wilderness to Israel or a land of thick darkness? Why do my people say, we are free to roam, we will come no more to thee? Why do you say that? Can a virgin forget her ornaments? Can a bride forget her attire? But my people have forgotten me, days without number. Oh, how well you prepare your way to seek love. This is interesting here. Oh, how well you prepare your way to seek love. You know, you, you know, you can picture this, right? Someone who is going on the date, 
puts a lot of time into making it just so. Oh, they put all this time and energy into seeking the ways that are wrong. He says, but listen, even the wicked women you have taught your ways. He said, what's wrong with this picture? It's bad enough. He said, if you're in a relationship, okay, you know the scripture says that bad company corrupts good morals. Remember this? So choose your friends really, really well because bad company corrupts good morals. In other words, if you have good morals and, and, and you're trying to walk well and you're trying to walk right, and then you've got some friend who's really, really worldly, that friend is going to pull you down. So choose your friends really, really well. You want to be a godly person in your life? Then choose godly friends and hang out with godly friends that are going to encourage you in your walk with the Lord. But he's saying here, look, if you're, if you're trying to get your life together and the worldly person's pulling you down, this is kind of the way, you know, that's bad, but that's, that's kind of the way that works. And he says, but let me tell you what's even worse than that. Let me tell you what's even worse than that. What's worse than that is when you're teaching that wicked person how to be wicked. You see his point? Wait a minute, you're the one that's influencing the wicked person. He said that, you see where it's, where it's wrong? He said, there's the picture. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to shake you up by saying it this way. And so he goes on. Verse 33, even the wicked you teach your ways. Also, on your skirts is found the lifeblood of the innocent poor. You didn't find them breaking in. But in spite of all these things, in spite of all these things, yet you said, I'm innocent. Nothing wrong with what I do. Surely his anger is turned away from me. He says, behold, I'm going to enter into judgment with you because you say, I have not sinned. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees? This should remind us of the Pharisees here because Jesus was talking about spiritual blindness. And at one point, the Pharisees said, are you saying that we're blind? Is that what you're saying? Are you saying that we're blind too? And Jesus said, if you knew, if you could only acknowledge that your blindness, that you're blind, then you would have sight. But because you say, I see, your blindness remains. Do you see his point? And so he says, please hear it. Please understand it. Verse 36, why do you go around so much changing your way? Also, you, put, you shall be put to shame by Egypt as you were put to shame by Assyria. These things that you hope in, they're going to hurt you. From this place also you shall go out with your hands on your head, for the Lord has rejected those in whom you trust, and you shall not prosper with them. In other words, with your hands on your head, that's how they go out when they're arrested. So he said, you're all going to walk out with your hands on your head, being taken into exile. In verse 1 of chapter 3, God says, if a husband divorces his wife, and she goes from him, and belongs to another man, Will he return to her? In other words, that's not right. Husband divorces his wife, and she goes from him, and belongs to someone else. Will he keep, quote, visiting her, if you get my point? He said, wait a minute, that's, that's not right. This is a land that's completely polluted. You are a harlot with many lovers. Let me just call it straight. And then... Listen to this. You are a harlot with many lovers, and then you turn to me, declares the Lord. Lift up your eyes to the bare heights and see. Where have you not been violated? In other words, where have you not had sex? That's what he's saying. By the roads? Oh, by the roads you sat for them like an Arab in the desert. Are you not? And you have polluted a land with your harlotry and with your wickedness. Therefore, the showers have been withheld. There have been no spring rains. Yet you had a harlot's forehead and refused to be ashamed. Have you not just now called to me and said, My father, you are my friend of my youth? Will he be angry forever? Will he be indignant to the end? Behold, you have spoken and done evil things, and you have had your way. Then the Lord said to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what faithless Israel did? This is the northern kingdom. 
She went up on every high hill and every, under a green tree, and she was a harlot there, every, every place. And I thought, oh, after she's done these things, she'll return to me. But she didn't return. And then her treacherous sister Judah, the southern kingdom, saw it. And I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah didn't fear. But she went and was a harlot also. And it came about because of the lightness of her harlotry that she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and with trees. And yet in spite of all this, her sister, treacherous Judah, did not return to me with all her heart, but only in deception, declares the Lord. And then the Lord said to me, faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words to the north. And say this, return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord, and I will not look upon you in anger. I am gracious, declares the Lord, and I will not be angry. Only this, acknowledge your sin, that you have transgressed against the Lord, and have scattered your favors to strangers under every green tree, and that you have not obeyed my voice. Return, faithless Israel, and I will be a master to you, and I will take you from one city and, and, and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you shepherds after my own heart, and I will feed you on knowledge and understanding. See, this is what you have to love about the Lord. He calls it straight, he throws cold water right in their face, and then comes the graciousness, come back. I will not be angry, I will forgive you, Return to me. Come on. Return, faithless ones, he says, and I will forgive you. And he says, if you would only do this, this is what I want you to do. I want you to admit that you're a sinner and that you need grace. See, w this is important, isn't it? Whenever we give a gospel presentation and we ask people, do you want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Always with it is this. You got to acknowledge your sin. You got to say, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I need you to forgive my sin. If we can own it, if we can take responsibility for it and say, you know what, Lord, you're right. You're right. When you say that I've made all these things and done all these things, you're right. I did. And I'm asking your forgiveness. God, would you forgive me? And you know what the Lord says in response to that? Thank you. Thank you. I wanted you to own it. I wanted you to say it, that this is a confession of your heart because here's my heart for you. I'll forgive you. I'll wash you clean. I'll make you my own. I will bring you home. Isn't that the story of the prodigal son? He's hair is a mess, his clothes are shattered, he's dirty, he's got sin all over him, and there's the father holding his son, loving his son, kissing his son. You're coming home. Don't you just love God? Don't you love his grace? Don't you love his mercy? Don't you love his love? It should cause us to just thank him again and again for how much he's loved us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for how you are so straightforward with your words to us, how you are, you're bold in declaring what we need to hear because we need it. Lord, we need to wake up. We need to spiritually respond to you. We need to own the fact that, God, we have wandered too far and we've been in the world and we've been doing worldly things. But, Lord, you're giving us the invitation to come home, the invitation to be made right, the invitation to have that relationship to you where you pour out your favor and your blessing. But Lord, this, you're asking us to acknowledge that we are sinners that need forgiveness. Well, Lord, even tonight, we own it. We own it. Say, you know what, Lord, you're right. You're right. I've been involved with things that are very worldly. And I can see that when you point them out to me, you're right. You're right. 
I can see that it makes my soul sick. I can see that it will ruin my life. And here you give me a great word. I'll forgive you. Well, Lord, tonight I receive it. I receive it. Church, if right now you are asking for the forgiveness of God in your life and are receiving it because his promise is sure, would you just raise your hand? Don't look around. Just raise your hand and just be honest to the Lord. God, I'm asking for your forgiveness and I know that you pour it out because of your great love the mercy. Lord, wash me with the blood of Jesus Christ and forgive me. I honor you and love you for it all. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, can we give the Lord praise and glory and honor?